Hi, I'm Jamie Flinchball, host of People Solve Problems, and today we have a special guest, Henry Yeager. Henry, how are you doing? Uh, good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for thanks for coming on. Um, so, a bit of background: uh, Henry's the the managing principal of the Banner Group LLC, has 30 years of corporate strategy and finance experience with companies like Hershey's, uh, uh, something I know pretty well, and a founder and investor to, to new ventures like Guide Health a digital health company where he's been serving as the founding CFO. He holds an MBA from Yale and is currently volunteer president of the Greater Philadelphia Chapter of the Private Directors Association, which is how I met you when I when I joined the Yes. joined the association. That's right, but but we have a few things in common because both our kids are graduating from Lehigh this year. That that they are. So we'll we'll uh at least run across each other probably in, in a few <laughs> weeks. Um Yes. Upon that 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 great graduation, uh, which we only discovered by accident almost when we when we first met. Uh, That's right. Had that in common. I think another thing we have in common is um, your 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 career path is very hard to summarize because it has many things going in parallel, and and it's not just a twist and turns. It's a whole lot of things going on at once. And uh, so so quite hard to summarize. But that's the that's the best we'll probably do. So. <laughs> so we have an interesting topic we decided to to talk about um and and especially now as you're you're involved in this this startup uh, that you co-founded guide health uh big moment big opportunity right uh, to jump all into something when you're perfectly busy doing other things um so so really the framing question we want to start with is how do you know uh when it's the right time to commit to go all in to a new opportunity as opposed to what many of us do, which is sit on the fence either forever or for too long? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a really important question. And in truth, you know, you never really know until afterwards. Right. Um, so um, as you're going through a process of deciding, you, you need to understand what your risks are. And so I think, you know, it's, it's really important to evaluate the opportunity and to understand and really fully embrace the worst case, right? So some things we decide are, you know, small risks, small duration commitments, maybe not a big economic uh, impact if it doesn't work out. Uh, and then other things have a much bigger impact. Uh, so one of the things that um, I like to think about, and I think Jamie, you and I have talked about this in the past, is thinking about most things in your life in terms of a portfolio, and like a portfolio, um, you can go through kind of a life cycle with opportunities. So, oops. <laughs> special special guest on the show is is your dog. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm I'm sitting outside on my patio enjoying spring weather, um, and uh, my dog decided to come out with me. So sorry about that. <laughs> if it gets too bad, I'll I'll move him aside. Um, but um, when you think about a portfolio, it's it's about you know balancing across opportunities and knowing how the, the choice that you're making at that moment fits with the other choices that you've made in the past, uh, but also where you are in, in your life cycle of your portfolio. So, you know, we know just from our retirement accounts and, and things like that, that, you know, you tend to take less risk at, at some times in your life as you get older, and then you tend to be, uh, you know, taking more risks. And so I think you kind of understand where you are as you enter into that decision process. Well, that's that's excellent. So, you know, I want to frame this a little around problem solving in, a, in in two ways specifically. One is that you know we're kind of largely talking about sort of career opportunities, but the the same fundamental thinking behind this that you're sharing applies as much to other areas in which you're committing to something, right? Committing to a new strategy, committing to a major product a refresh. Right, uh, uh, you know, committing to upgrade to SAP, SAP HANA, right? Whatever, you know, any big commitment, uh, you know, you kind of have to go all in on. How do you make that decision? So, you know, and I'll come back to some of the things you mentioned, but problem solving specifically, right? Some problems are just really big, and to decide to even work on that problem is its own commitment. And then some of the best solutions to your big, hairy problems involve a big commitment. And so you have to decide whether or not to go all in on that. So, so while, while there's some, some very specifics around sort of, you know, your, your personal career choices, um, 
you know, there, there's a lot of parallels to other aspects of problem solving. You know, so I want people to hear it in, in that, in both contexts, right? I, I think, I think that that's right on. And I think, um, you know, having uh, an approach, a decision framework, or just really starting with like, you know, do I, do I, am I asking the right questions? Um, those questions and that approach should scale, right? So if you're dealing with something, you know, really small, like, you know, what you're going to do, what movie you're going to see or going to dinner, um, it, sh- it should be more or less the same framework or the same approach when you're doing something big. And so some of those, those issues may not have a big consequence. So you may not, it may not be worth investing a lot of time in them, mm-hmm. but essentially uh, you're making trade-offs. And so the question is, do you have a full awareness of the trade-offs that you're making and how does that fit with your bigger picture goals? So in, in my case, I was fortunate enough to get to a place where I could take a lot of, you know, call them medium sized risks with my time, with, with my resources, because I had already established a certain baseline mm-hmm. that wasn't going to change radically even if things, you know, ended up in the worst case. Right. Now, sometimes when you're in it and you're in the worst case, it doesn't feel that way. But um, in the end, you know, you don't, uh, you have the resilience that you've already built into your own system to be able to overcome those, those uh, situations when they don't work out. Yeah. So I want to tie that back to risk um, because, you know, risk is relative, right. To what you, (laughs) what you have available to lose or, 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 what you're willing to lose. Um, so I, I really like the, the phrase embrace the worst case scenario. Right. And, and I, and I've had my own experiences with that where even my, my first startup, which is still going today, um, but has not yielded a financial return. So for a long time, I referred to it as my hundred thousand dollar MBA. <laughs> um, even though I had another MBA, but this was the one that I actually probably paid more money for since I had a fellowship for the other one. I learned a lot. Right. So that, you know, what's the worst case? I learn a lot. I spend a bunch of money and, and time in the process. So a lot of these risks, or a lot of these commitments involve ambiguity in those risks. Um, so how do you how do you process? How do you identify them? How do you process those risks in a in a rational way that that makes sense? Um, and I'll say especially, you know, the earlier you are in your career, the, the less less information you have to assess those risks. Yeah, well, so, you know, again, there's no one right way, but um, but a, a lot of times you just know that it it's a fit or not a fit. So there's a little bit of, of your gut involved in just, you know, your willingness to even consider an opportunity. Some things are just not going to be interesting to you. Other people may tell you it's a great opportunity. It's really, you know, the greatest thing. But if, if you don't feel attracted to it for whatever reason, um, you know, that that's a reason to just, you know, walk away without doing a lot of further due diligence, but then assuming that it does seem of interest to you, or you don't know enough to say that it's not, um, then you go through a process of asking questions about the opportunity. Usually there's a lot of information that is available that you haven't fully accessed or processed. And so the question for yourself is, you know, what is there more to know about this that maybe I haven't asked for? Maybe that I haven't done a little bit of research. It's so easy to research things now to get background information, to understand uh, competitors, to know what trends are. So there's stuff like that, that sometimes we skip over and we shouldn't if it's a really important uh, commitment that we're going to make. Yeah. Um, one, one thing I like to ask, um, and I, I do this um, sort of in, in, the, in some of the ventures I've been in is, um, you know, who knows more than I do? <laughs> sometimes it's somebody on your team, but sometimes it's not. And mm-hmm. we, we like to have advisors and, you know, when we're doing new ventures, we like to, you know, create our list of advisors. It's sort of impressive that we have all these people who are willing to spend time with us. Um, but then we don't fully access what they know. And so when, when you, when you have advisors, I think the question is, you know, what do they know that maybe I don't know? And how does that, uh, how is that relevant to something I'm about to decide on? Yeah. No, so I, it's really interesting because in in there you basically said, you know, trust your intuition, but also when there's information, more information available, go, go, go research analytically and and thoroughly. And, and so both can be true at the same time. Absolutely. And and it's a little bit of a hazard and I've had this um, uh, 
I would say like debate or kind of fight <laughs> debate with with my uh, current CEO, and we sort of came to like I think a happy compromise, which is um, you you need your gut, uh, but you can't rely on it as the only source. Uh, he's a very intuitive decision maker. Uh, it's how he you know you know decided that he wanted me as his co-founder, and and then we went off and and actually recruited a whole team of co-founders. Um, but you can't you can't rely on it solely. And the question is. Is there information that I haven't accessed? Because the gut gets you in the right direction of something you might be interested in, but it, it shouldn't be the only factor. Right. No, I love that. And and I, I think that's the, uh, you know, hey, are you an intuitive-based decision maker or an analytical-based decision maker? It's You really should be both, right? And 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 I think uh, we don't say that often enough. Um, so I want to I want to get to the portfolio uh, idea because... You know, there's, there's a lot of people out say talk about abundance thinking and say yes to everything, and and there's just there's just limits to that, right? And you can't you can't say you know I, I've done this to myself where I have a little hole in my available capacity. I say yes to something which fills up 150 percent of that that hole, and then there there really is no room to say yes to something even more interesting down down the road. Um, so so how do you? Uh, you know, knowing that we 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 can always squeeze a little more in, right? There's always there's always another hour in the day. Not always, but there's, there's often another hour in the day. There's uh getting more efficient. There's learning all of that. So it's not a static thing. But how do you balance? You know, short term, long term, big opportunities, small opportunities. Um, how do how do you think about that as a portfolio? Because everything's at a different state or a different phase as you're trying to say yes or no to things. Yeah, well, I think there's several things I could comment on based on on your your what you just said. You know, uh, one thing is, um, you know, back to your your schedule example. Um, you know, not all commitments are equal, right? And I think sometimes we tend to um, treat them as equal. You put something on your calendar, so you don't want to get out of it. You put something, you say you're going to do something, you don't want to, you know, your circumstances change, but you don't want to sort of break that commitment. But that commitment um, isn't a commitment unless you say it's a commitment, right? So, so I think you have to be willing to rebalance and to change your mind. And I think if you do that, um, it, it frees up a lot of capacity for you to pursue the things that are most relevant, most interesting, most rewarding for you. And so I often give out my contact information and I have people who link into me all the time and I you know, try to meet two people a week. and. Um, I, um, you know, I tell them, you know, re reach out and if I can, I'll help you, you know, if I can, I'll tell you, you know, but, but don't not ask. And then right. I'm going to prioritize, you know, my time with you based on other things I have going on. And it's not that I don't like you or I don't want to help you. It's just going to be in the context of, of what are the things I have. So the first thing is just, you know, sometimes commitments all seem that they're equal because mm -hmm. we say they're commitments, but they're not. And you have to be willing to change your mind. Yeah. The, the, the second thing is um, back to kind of like the life cycle idea. You know, so some things um, you're just not ready for yet. You know, so even though, you know, back to this kind of like abundance idea, right? You know, the, the, there could be some really great opportunities, um, but they're going to be better for you if you've prepared. They're going to be better for you if you've gotten some under, other things under your belt first. And so it's okay to have opportunities that are deferred. It's okay to have opportunities that absolutely align with your hopes and dreams and interests, but that are not the ones that you should pursue today. And the key is to know why you're saying yes to something or not. It's based on, you know, your situation at that moment. And it doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, not pursue it ever. It just means today. No. Yeah. No, I think that you know we we think the uh, that's the one and only chance, right? <laughs> um, is is right in front of us, and and if we pass it up, it's gone forever. Um, even the some of the entrepreneurs at uh, at Lehigh, the student entrepreneurs, you know, they'll ask a question like, "Hey, how do I learn more about this industry I'm trying to do a startup in?" And the most, it's not always the right answer, but the most obvious answer that is never considered is go work in it for two years. Right. You know, and and defer, you know, you can work on your startup on the side, but defer getting into it for for two years while you're learning everything you need to learn in order to 
to go forward. And there's a lot of professions where that happens naturally, like legal profession. Hey, I want to start my own practice, but I'm going to work for somebody else for a few years first. It's uh, still more linear, but it, it's it's a, it's, a, yep. it's a missed opportunity. We often see it that way. Yeah, and I'll give you um, a, a counter example or like the inverse of that, just just because just I, I just thought of it. And sorry, my my dog again. Um, so it is that um, I just remember like I, I had an opportunity. I had actually done a startup that uh, kind of failed, or basically I left as it was failing right after I got my MBA. This was you know 1999, 2000, and I found myself married and starting to have kids. Right, so um, so got to buckle down, get a job. You know, so I, I got a job at Unilever, you know, large consumer products company and finance, and I worked really hard. Like I, I was basically three years behind, uh, you know, kind of took an entry level MBA job and, uh, and got promoted a couple of times in, in the first year and then had an opportunity that um, I really didn't understand. And I knew it was going to be hard, probably, but I really didn't understand it. And I worked really hard and I learned so much. But it's the kind of thing where if I had understood, I just never would have taken that job. <laughs> but but because I did, it gave me so much experience and perspective. Mm-hmm. I had experience, uh, you know, we had basically we merged two big bank companies together. And um, and I was like the first Sarbanes-Oxley person, if you remember what that was. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and just, um, you know, tremendous growth for me personally. But if I had understood it more fully, uh, I, I would have said, oh, I'm not ready. Um, but, you know, I was standing next to the problem. They needed somebody and they were willing to take a chance on me. And it, it ended up, you know, working out really well. Um, but but so, sometimes you just you just leap because in that case, uh, the worst case was that I was going to suffer a little bit in my learning, you know, and, and, and it ended up actually being, you know, quite tough. Um, but um, but I was you know, embraced and and valued by that organization. And I got so much learning from it that, uh, that it was definitely, um, the worst case was actually quite good. Yeah. No, I love that because it's, uh, you know, while I'm a big fan of, you know, reading books, um, what a great learning experience, which you can't beat doing it in person. So, um, so hard earned learning can sometimes be the best kind. So I ask you one last quick question, um, only sem- semi-related to what we were talking about, just in the spirit that we both have uh, kids graduating college in a few weeks. Um, what's your what's your best nugget of advice for for those graduating and heading out into the world? Wow, that's that's a the big a big responsibility to answer that one. Um, well, I can tell you that um, one of the things that that I, I wish I had understood more when I was at in that situation, and I know each kid's different, and so I try not to, you know, give, give them advice as much as just give them questions. Um, but I, I I probably didn't appreciate um, how valuable I was for people who wanted me to help them with whatever they were doing. And you get a lot of mixed signals when you're coming out, you know. So the, so the, I guess the question is. Um, like, how do you know that you can't be valuable to somebody that you haven't had a conversation with? Love it. So reach out, have a conversation. It's every, People love to talk to new graduates. They'll at least give you 15 minutes. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I appreciate all that. I appreciate um, sharing your perspective. And I'm, I'm sure there's a lot people uh, can take away from today's episode. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the People Solve Problems podcast. Let's keep the conversation going. Visit jflinch.com for more episodes and other content. And continue to join us on your podcast app, of course. We greatly appreciate your feedback through reviews and ratings. Consider expanding your understanding of problem solving with Jamie's book, People Solve Problems, The Power of Every Person, Every Day, Every Problem. Available on Amazon. Until next time, keep learning, innovating, and solving problems.